allows the, the Amper uh, ecosystem to work. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the programming models, the HPC programming models that allow predictable uh, parallel execution, and also how we target resilience in the project. So uh, the idea is that uh, for the applications that we are targeting uh, and, the, and the hardware architectures that, uh, that we have in the project, it is needed not only to fulfill the high performance and non-functional requirements uh, at the modeling level, but also through the whole software architecture. And this includes the coding, the analysis, and also the execution uh, of the system. So for that, as we already presented before, we presented these parallel programming models uh, have uh, already proved their uh, suitability to expose parallelism in an easy manner and to achieve uh, performance uh, from complex uh, parallel and heterogeneous architectures. Uh, and in this scope, uh, we chose OpenMP because it gives this programmability, it also gives the performance, but it gives something that is very, very important, which is the portability, because this allows uh, having simpler systems uh, that can be reused uh, in many different configurations and platforms. So OpenMP uh, is an API, application program interface, that is based on compiler directives, which are uh, these annotations uh, that you will see in the code. Uh, it is meant for shared memory systems, but for many years it includes also support for accelerators. Um, and depending on the directives that we use, uh, work is going to be uploaded to the accelerator or not. And as you can see, it is built on top of C++ and also Fortran. So just a brief, brief introduction about OpenMP. It implements a fork join model of parallelism with the parallel directive, uh, parallelism is spawned. And at the end of this parallel directive, there is an implicit barrier that joins the parallelism. And then uh, if we focus on the tasking model of OpenMP, which is our target in the Amper project, the task directive and the target directive allow to define the units of work. And when using a task, we are defining the work to be executed in the host and when we use the target, the work is going to be uploaded to uh, an accelerator device. And very interestingly, uh, the regions of code in OpenMP that expose OpenMP tasks can be represented uh, with a specific type of graph, which is this task dependency graph, which is a direct acyclic graph that represents the parallel nature of the region uh, that, uh, that is exposing the tasks. So as we mentioned before, Amper is about fulfilling non-functional requirements uh, in, in, the, in the complex system. And in particularly in this section of the, of the webinar, we are going to talk about performance, resilience, time predictability, and energy. I'm going to focus on the two first, performance and resilience, that are achieved in the project through model-to-code transformation, and in particular by using OpenMP. Uh, in this transformation. And then uh, my colleagues will talk about time predictability and energy through a different pipeline, which is the multi-criteria optimization, uh, which is based on this uh, task dependency graph representation. So focusing on the, on the two first, I'm going to start with performance. But first of all, uh, how the complete uh, Ampere ecosystem works. Uh, we we'll start by defining um, the, the different use cases by using modeling tools that have already been presented, Capella and Marcia, based on these models and the code synthesis tool that is included in the ABP4MC platform. We translate Amathia models into parallel OpenMP code. And then through compilation techniques, uh, we are able to generate this task dependency graph representation, which is used by the multi-criteria pipeline to, uh, to analyze and optimize the different non-functional requirements that we target in the project. And the compiler, besides this task dependency graph, it also generates, of course, the binaries 
uh, that are executed in the in the parallel platforms through different parallel runtimes, uh, including the OpenMP1 of LLVM, which is KMP, uh, CUDA for the for the GPU, and Thread for the FPGA. And then we work with different operating systems depending on the on the platform and the hypervisor that allows to target uh, safety. So I'm going to focus on three different components, which are the APP forensic platform, in particular the Amalthea models that are described in this framework, then uh, OpenMP, and the task dependency graph uh, representation that we get out of uh, task-based uh, programs uh, using OpenMP. So the first of all, to be able to translate Amalthea models into OpenMP code is to understand whether the two, uh, the two abstractions are compatible. So Amalthea software is composed mainly of tasks, what we can call real-time tasks, uh, which is uh, this part at the bottom. These tasks are, uh, are composed of an activity graph uh, that is a series of, uh, of calls to runnables and then runnables are defined based on, on the data accesses uh, that they do to memory and also the amount of uh, time that they take to execute. So we can exploit uh, parallelism at three different levels in this, in this kind of model. One level is, am is among Amalthea tasks. This is a coarse-grained concurrency model and, and the communication between the different tasks is mainly event-based. Uh, so this kind of parallelism uh, based on described through deadlines and, and recurrence is typically handled by the operating system because the schedulers at this level are prepared for this kind of information. Then we have another level, which is uh, at the, at the Amalthea runnable level. So we can exploit parallelism between the runnables in, a, in an Amalthea task. This is a finer grain parallelism that uh, that is described through a data flow execution model is not even based as the as the Amalthea tasks and currently in in Amalthea models this is uh, this uh, activity graph of the tasks is deployed as a sequential uh, execution so all the runnables are run sequentially and we could exploit parallelism here through parallel running models like OpenMP. And then the last level is inside the, the runnables. This is an even thinner uh, grain parallelism, which is currently transparent to the model because the contents of the runnables are not exposed. But it's important to understand that we can also exploit this parallelism through parallel running models, which can be the same or not that is exploited to, uh, that we want to exploit for parallelism uh, between runnables. So this is what we did in the project. Uh, we analyzed uh, how the runnables are interconnected within a, an Amalthea task and how Amalthea tasks deploy these runnables based on task scheduling constraints. And we concluded that this is compatible with OpenMP. So what we did is to define a series of, of transformations with the, to go from the model to OpenMP code. The different uh, runnables, runnable calls in, a, in an Amalthea task are transformed into, into function calls of a C program. Then we have a specific custom property that we have included into the tasks to define that we want to exploit parallelism, interrunnable parallelism, and that particular task. Uh, so with this custom property, we generate the specific constructs to, to expose this parallelism. And then the context defined in the runnable calls, as was presented by Michael before, tells us whether we have to use a target construct if we are going to exploit parallelism in the device, or we need a task construct if this parallelism is to be exploited in the host. And then the different, uh, the different accesses to the memory that are represented in the runnables are used to describe the dependency clauses of the, of the tasks, uh, host and device tasks. And we have uh, an specific directive 
which is the task of directive. This is uh, not yet in the open and specification. We have developed this directive and a complete framework to support it uh, within the Ampere project. And what this directive is doing is uh, just giving a hint to the compiler. So it knows that inside there is a code that can exploit uh, the, this task dependency graph representation because everything uh, inside, all the computation inside, is included within a task. So the complete user code can be uh, replaced by this task dependency graph representation. So the important thing is that in this in this graph, we have included not only the parallel units and the synchronizations, which, which are the, the components of the graph itself, but we also include the characterization of the execution of the parallel units. And this allows us to do this uh, analysis and optimization of the functional and non-functional uh, constraints uh, of the system. But furthermore, uh, this, this task dependency graph representation enables optimizations to obtain a better performance. Uh, and this is because uh, it allows the runtime to fully orchestrate the execution of the tasks without the need to go to, to the user code. So we avoid context switching, uh, context switching and we reduce the number of instructions. Uh, we also allow, uh, avoid contention on shared resources and avoid uh, some overhead uh, in the system. And another important factor is that uh, the task dependency graph representation enables also different static analysis techniques that allow to uh, uh, conclude whether the code uh, is correct with respect to the parallelization. So we avoid uh, having base conditions. And it also allows uh, timing analysis techniques uh, for predictable execution. So going to the evaluation, we have evaluated uh, this, uh, this framework on the PCC use case, um, which was presented before. Uh, this table shows a characterization of the system because it's important to understand where we can put OpenMP and where it's going to be uh, we are going, where are we going to get benefits out of the parallelization? So there are four components in this PCC uh, use case. And three of them show a very, very fine granularity. We are talking about the order of tens of microseconds of the execution of each runnable, which is really tiny. Instead, the ACC component exposes a granularity, which is coarser. And, and by analyzing this, uh, this uh, characterization of the system, we decided to put OpenMP only on the ACC component because although other components could show parallelism, like uh, it's the case of the power control, the engine control management system, uh, the granularity was not going to allow us to, to get performance. So what we obtained when running in the Jetson platform, this, uh, this PCC, use case uh, is that since we only parallelize a, a, the ACC, I'm only showing the, the performance speed up of this one. And as you can see, we are getting a speed up uh, up to two and, and up to four threads. So why is this? We are trying to get parallelism out of six tasks in a, in a component. Um, that has, I mean, sorry, in the runnables of this component, but this component is running in parallel with many other components that exploit the, that exploit the ROS communication framework. And this framework is already exploited parallelism. So when we get to two or four threads in the system, all four cores of the GPU are, of the CPU in the JSON are already loaded. So it does not matter that we put more open and big threads because this is only putting more overhead in the system. There is not more parallelism available in the machine to get performance out of. So uh, what we did later is to uh, exploit the GPU as well. So in the PCC use case, the TSR component has a specializations for the GPU. And what we saw, uh, so you are seeing here the speed up with respect to, to the CPU in the TSR component and with respect to the CPU in the ACC component. 
So in the TSR, which is the one that we are uploading to the GPU, we are not getting performance in most of the most of the runaways. Uh, sorry, most of the Amaltia tasks. And this is because uploading to the GPU in these tiny grained components is not suitable, even though the, the computation in the GPU is faster. This is not the case of some other uh, runables and tasks that suffer a lot in the CPU when we increase the number of threads. So putting those on the GPU is uh, alleviating this overhead of the system and is, get, is allowing us to get better performance. But more importantly, the fact that we don't gain in the DSR is due to the granularity of the, of the work that we are trying to float. But putting this work in the GPU is letting other work in the CPU to go fast, faster than it would go if the TSR was on, on the CPU as well. And this is what we see in this, in this graph on the right. So moving to resilience, which is the other uh, non-functional requirement that I'm going to talk about, we define two different um, mechanisms in the Ampere project. One is replication, and the second one is observation. So about replication, we based uh, this mechanism on the ACIL or SIL levels defined in the models. So we, uh, we replicate work that has some, some level of uh, security defined there. And we can, we can parameterize uh, based on different, with different parameters, like the number of replicas, which is the consolida consolidation function to use to decide whether the code is correct or not, the execution is correct or not, and also the type of replication, uh, allowing a spatial replication or temporal replication. And then another optimization that, uh, that we allow is uh, this moon safety architecture, which moon stands for M out of N. So if we have N replicas, this safety architecture will allow the system to stop the replicas once M out of the N have already finished correctly. And on the right, you see what is the syntax we defined for OpenMP and how a TDG for a spatial replication would look like, having all the original task and the replicas running in parallel. The other mechanism is the proactive monitoring. Uh, this is a more general and lightweight, uh, lightweight software technique that is based on the observer of the same pattern. So it allows to, to define a critical internet variables that can be monitored with a, with a minimal uh, coupling between the code the, of the application and the observation code. And it allows correctness correct checking based on predicates. So these variables can be checked uh, through the execution of the program and to see if the predicate still fulfills or not uh, and, and detect uh, problems. And the problems that want to be detected are, are mainly transient uh, software faults to avoid silent errors that could at some point lead to a system malfunctioning. So what we did is to evaluate the replication on the other system, uh, in particular in the tracking and the association and tracking module that has three different phases, the big association and update that are included in the track phase. And we use different data sets uh, with different loads in the images to see how the, the, the system behaves. And what we had uh, with a triple replication, so we, we have original task and three extra replicas, is that we obtain uh, an accuracy that is uh, best when we combine the two mechanisms, having both replication and observation. And then uh, depending on the nature of the, of the phase, we have that sometimes observation works better, uh, when errors do not show, and someone's replic sometimes replication works better. And regarding the overhead, since in this system we had the spare resources to, to execute the replicas, we have that uh, for this three uh, x replication, we, don't, we have a maximum of 100% of overhead in the system compared to the non-replicated version. So that's all from my side. I will leave the floor to, to the colleagues to explain the rest of non-functional requirements. <clears throat> okay, so thank you, Sara. So I will share my screen.
Okay, so uh, our next talk, we'll be talking on uh, how in Ampere we have uh, addressed uh, the time predictability. So, uh, and I will start by going back to, uh, to the workflow that Sarah presented, uh, where we have the different steps of how Ampere deals with the, the, um, the propagation of information, the extraction of information in order to provide the, the different criteria that we use to analyze the system. And I will focus here on this phase where we actually extract the, the information on the uh, timing information from the, from the applications. So basically, in this phase, the goal is to extract uh, the enough information on the execution of the applications on the platforms in order to be able to evaluate how the applications deal with, uh, with time. So basically, as Sarah mentioned, so the, the compiler is responsible for uh, generating the, the binaries and also the task dependency graph. And uh, what the profiling phase is to take the different uh, configurations that we can have in the system and the different type of uh, variants in the, uh, in the execution from the uses of the application either in CPU, GPU, or FPGA, and actually execute these in the platform. So these are complex platforms that we are, that we are considering. There is also the, the mention of uh, being maybe too complex, but in any case, uh, the goal is to be able to extract traces of the execution and check that the, um, the information that we are able to, to extract concerning um, the execution time of the individual OpenMP tasks in the, in the system, but we also extract information on how these tasks deal with uh, access to shared resources like uh, caches or others and, uh, and memory. And so the goal is to be able to extract a, a lot of meaningful information from for the different potential configurations for the different potential executions in the system and to that to provide uh, the ability to uh, do some timing analysis which can be either um, very extensive with many different um, abilities uh, so worst case execution time analysis based on measurement based extreme uh, value analysis uh, and in order to uh, extract for each one of the individual tasks in their worst case, but also average execution times, so we are able to, to compare both, which is uh, also relevant for our analysis. And this is for individual OpenMP tasks, but also for the uh, full task dependency graph, uh, the execution, we are able to, uh, uh, to extract uh, both volume, but also the length of the critical path, the, the make span, worst case average, and also the potential parallelism that we are able to, to extract from, from these executions. So this is the, the flow that allows us to annotate back in the task dependency graph all of this information uh, where this can be used for further uh, processing. So just a, as a quick example here of some of the information that we are uh, that we extracted from the execution of the code generated from the models of the, of the use cases, uh, where we can see both for uh, two examples of tasks, one from the others, or another one from the PCC use case, uh, and also the the values for the the full task dependency graphs of uh, the radar processing task and the perception uh, for ACC. Uh, task in the um, in these use cases. So having extracted all of these uh, values, all of this information, going back to the flow, we are able to uh, first provide some uh, optimization related to time. So we are uh, worked on the ability to be able to uh, perform uh, a static mapping of these tasks, uh, these OpenMP tasks to the cores in the system in order to optimize the execution related to response times. So not only guaranteeing the deadlines of applications, but also minimizing the response time of the, of the same applications. And we do this by using a, a static mapping approach. So the idea is to reduce variability in the execution 
And this reduction of variability has two, two advantages. One is actual less variability in the execution time, but also uh, less variability in the analysis phase. And this is important because worst case response time analysis is mostly based on, uh, well, worst case, so actual corner cases. So uh, cases where different interleavings, a very complex interleavings, actually cause a, a large response time. So by reducing variability, also we allow for less pessimism in the analysis. So what we do is uh, that we actually have a set of heuristics for mapping. We simulate all of these heuristics based on the results that we have notated in the past dependency graph. And we, from these simulations and the analysis of the application properties, we are actually able to determine, okay, if we achieve the result where we need to actually profile again, so a new configuration is found that we can reprofile and uh, uh, get new information from that configuration, or if we are able to actually uh, achieve a configuration where uh, we have uh, the response time that we are confident and that uh, fulfills our requirements. And for this, the heuristics that we uh, that we have, uh, we are considering heuristics for two different phases. So we are considering that the uh, OpenMP tasks are firstly allocated to the uh, to the different threads in the system, one thread per core, and then we have also a dispatching phase where the thread actually selects the the task that uh, will be executed next. In fact, the task part that will be executed next. For the first phase, we have several heuristics from uh, time-related heuristics like execution time or idle time to structural related uh, heuristics such as the number of task parts in the, in, the, in the task. For the dispatching, the heuristics are mostly based on uh, execution time and uh, response time. Here you can find some, some results where we have compared uh, actually one of the uh, best achieving combination of heuristics, which is based on uh, execution time. And we have compared with the uh, vanilla um, first scheduling, work first scheduling, but also a previous heuristic that uh, already existed and that uh, we sh were able to achieve um, so a high improvement, uh, except for a couple of cases, uh, particularly for the cases where we are focusing. So the, the cases where we are focusing uh, is uh, when you have one level of nested tasks, and this is the case that we are tackling in uh, Ampere, where you have the, the runnable structure mapped to uh, so the fine grain parallelism that uh, uh, Sarah mentioned, but also the two level nest tasks, which are the, the skinny level parallelism that we can achieve by also parallelizing inside the, the runnables, and this is also focus of the, um, of the work. We actually also implemented two of these uh, heuristics in, uh, uh, in the LLVM, so in the actual uh, mapping that LLVM OpenMP runtime does uh, during execution. And we have compared with, with the vanilla LLVM implementation, which is mostly based in a variant of work stealing. And the, the fact is that uh, we are achieved that for more contention. So when we have uh, four uh, threads in four cores uh, sharing the L2, or when we have occupying the full system, so this is in, in the NVIDIA CPUs of so the eight threads in eight cores. And we are actually, we're able to see that uh, we can reduce uh, actual uh, worst case response time, measured worst case response time, because there's less contention in the, in the system. So basically with, with this, we can then uh, go back and uh, actually provide a mapping that uh, optimizes the execution time, the response time of the, of the applications in the system. The same uh, flow can also be used in order to extract the timing information that is used later for a multi-criteria optimization phase that also considers the, uh, the energy uh, the energy consumption of the platform, and that's going to be the subject of the of the two next talks, and uh, the next one on energy, and then the other one on the multi-criteria optimization phase. Okay, so I'm 
leaving now for, for my colleagues to, to continue. Sergio, it's up to you. Yeah, hello, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, you see the slides, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, I'm Sergio from uh, ETA Zurich, and uh, I'm going to walk you through how we deal with energy efficiency in, uh, in the Ampere ecosystem. So energy is the other uh, non-functional requirement that we try to optimize for, as uh, Miguel was saying. And in order to do this, uh, well, we need some measures or estimates of uh, energy. Um, we do this through performance counters based power models. Um, why is that? Um, Ampere is targeting uh, modern high performance systems, which usually feature a high degree of heterogeneity in parallelism and uh, features such as uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. Um, so one may say, okay, you can use uh, analog power sensors to, uh, to measure, to estimate uh, energy. Uh, the thing is that these kind of sensors are slow with respect to the high performance systems that, uh, that we target. And also they provide no uh, level of introspection uh, for the platform resources. Uh, so we rely to, on performance counters, which are much closer to the digital hardware domain, and they provide fast and reliable uh, uh, measurements. Uh, nevertheless, uh, requiring no integration, basically, and so being very cheap to use. Uh, also, on top of these performance counters, we can build uh, architecture agnostic uh, power models through our data-driven parameter selections. Uh, so we can decide which performance counters to use for our power models. Uh, in a data-driven way, which makes these models very flexible and platform independent. Uh, and we can also provide support for uh, uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling and uh, any arbitrary level of granular granularity, nevertheless having uh, high modeling accuracy and uh, low overhead for the model estimation. So how do we put all this together? Uh, well, we use um, the concept of lookup table for a system level power model which basically means that we have uh, one power model for each subsystem, for example, for the CPU or for the GPU, and for each frequency of each subsystem. And each entry of this uh, lookup table is uh, uh, a linear power model, which is driven by performance counters. Uh, this uh, modeling methodology uh, provides us with models which have a very low overhead, uh, still supporting uh, the heterogeneity and DVFS capabilities of our target platforms. Then through these power estimates, uh, we compute energy uh, by means of uh, time estimates or time measures provided uh, from outside. Uh, so let's quickly go through uh, the, the process of this uh, uh, modeling. So the first step is to have a workload selection. Uh, this is, we, we, you have to be very careful here because um, we, we, want to, we want our estimates to be independent on the kind of workloads that you use to train your models. So you want to make sure to cover um, with your workloads all of your subsystems um, and to cover enough uh, kind of behaviors of each subsystem. Once you have your workload set up, um, we do a one-time platform characterization, which is uh, a statistical selection of the best hardware counters uh, which we use to model uh, uh, the power consumption. And this is done uh, entirely autonomously through uh, data-driven statistical methodologies. Once you know uh, which counters to use for your models, then um, uh, we train uh, each uh, linear model and we build uh, the lookup table I was mentioning. Um, so the workload selection and the training phase, they are pretty uh, self-explanatory, but I wanted to draw your attention to the platform characterization. Uh, as I was saying, this is a, a statistical data-driven approach. We call it data-driven because we really rely only on the uh, correlation information between the performance counters and the power consumption. And this, uh, this is uh, done uh, entirely automatically with really uh, minimal manual intervention and thus requires, uh, does not require any architectural knowledge of the, of the target pl platform, just uh, the counters that it exposes. And this means that this methodology is really uh, flexible and, uh, and portable to, easily portable to any platform, which makes your life very easy 
um, when this kind of complex uh, heterogeneous and parallel system are um, involved. And this must be done, this requires a uh, tour of profiling, but uh, needs to be done only one time per each platform. So it briefly, it consists of um, profiling all the counters exposed uh, by, by the platform together with the power consumption uh, corresponding to the counters activity. Um, then you do, yes, you do this for uh, every available counter. And then uh, you uh, compute the correlation index between each counter and, uh, and the power consumption. Uh, we use a linear correlation uh, coefficient, uh, Pearson correlation coefficient. And then you can basically rank uh, the performance counters, um, seeing which one correlates best with the power consumption, and then take the best ones. Uh, and this is where you can fine tune the trade off between the uh, number of counters that you want to use for your models, uh, which correspond to the model evaluation overhead and the uh, estimation accuracy of the model. Um, I'm going to show you some results that we collected uh, for these uh, power energy models. Um, uh, here I'm telling you a bit about our target platform, uh, the NVIDIA Jetson AG Xavier. Um, and it has a, a eight core CPU with per cluster DVFS. This means that uh, all the cores uh, at any point in time, they have the same uh, frequency. And the CPU has 29 nominal frequencies. Uh, and the uh, Xavier also has uh, a 500 core uh, GPU with 14 uh, nominal frequencies. Uh, so as you see, it's like a perfect platform targeted by Ampere. It's very heterogeneous. It also feature uh, more uh, um, uh, accelerators and it's uh, highly parallel. Uh, moreover, it has uh, some uh, power monitors on board, uh, which we use to uh, to collect our uh, um, power measures data set, um, which are uh, integrated in the platform, but they are very useful to build models uh, to, to show how you can build uh, power models which have higher accuracy and um, uh, responsiveness with respect to analog current sensors. Um, for the sake of time here, I'm showing you just a case study with the CPU uh, power modeling of the Xavier. And here you can see uh, the results of the CPU platform characterization. So on the, on the X axis, you have the different frequencies uh, of the CPU that we want to model. And on the Y axis, you can see uh, the correlation uh, coefficients of uh, of the performance counters. Um, so we we try to perform the plasma characterization at every frequency and then take the uh, best counters uh, at every frequency. And you can see that uh, the counters that uh, correlate better with the power consumption, they can vary based on uh, which frequencies you are running at. Then we take the best ones. And we know uh, how to, to train uh, our model. And these I'm showing you uh, example results of uh, several benchmarks. Um, uh, and in, in gray, uh, you can see the, the power uh, of the measure by the sensor over time. And in orange, there is the estimate from our, our model. And you can see how accurately they can follow the, the actual power consumption over time. Um, and with the uh, instantaneous average power of uh, uh, about 4%, and uh, about 4% also the energy estimation error. Um, when you put this uh, together in the context of the lookup table I was mentioning, so you have a system level uh, uh, power model. Um, you also can see a power, uh, instantaneous power uh, average error of uh, about 7% with an energy estimation error of uh, almost 1%, so it's very low. And still you can appreciate the uh, decomposability um, characteristics of this kind of models, because you can have both the energy uh, estimation or the power estimation at the level of the whole system or also for the individual subsystem. So uh, for the CPU or for the GPU. Uh, so yes, yeah, summarizing a bit, uh, we saw how from the platform characterization, which is done one time per platform, you get the best counters correlating with the power consumption that you can use then to train and validate your uh, power models uh, in the in the lookup table uh, approach. Um, but I also want to show you how this fits in the entire Ampere ecosystem. So by now you must be familiar with this uh, with the Ampere uh, workflow. And uh, let's focus on the multi-criteria uh, optimization loop. Um, so we are talking about energy efficiency and 
um, we have the TDG uh, generated from the profiling of the of the um, uh, use cases. Um, in the TDG for each task during the profiling, there are some statistics uh, uh, collected, which can be uh, the average uh, values of the performance counters and the task runtime. So we want to annotate the TDG with energy information. So we take this data and through our model, um, we compute the uh, energy uh, consumption estimation for each task of the TDG, which we then um, annotate back in the, in the TDG in the multi-criteria optimization loops so that um, now uh, the optimization loop is aware of energy information and can also uh, optimize for this further uh, non-functional constraint. Uh, and uh, this would be uh, it from my side. Uh, so uh, I will leave the floor to the next uh, optimization technology. Uh, Tomas is going to tell you about that. Um, I think we have a question, actually, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, sure. I'm not sure <laughs> if it's for you or if it's for someone else, but I think we'll we'll let you see. You can decide who it goes to. <laughs> so the question is, since you're using data analysis techniques, have you considered using machine learning to build a black box energy usage predictor DNN without building explicit linear predictors? You are mentioning you mentioned using DVFs. How do you manage to estimate DCETs, not power, when using DVFS? And if this is something maybe you want to respond later, that's fine. We can say that. So just wanted to let you know that there was a question. Oh, uh, I can also quickly answer now to the first question. Perfect. And uh, yeah, of course, we we definitely considered also using artificial like uh, neural networks to to train uh, power models. The, the thing is that one of the targets that we had here was also to run these models uh, at runtime. And um, we, we selected in the end just uh, simple linear models because first of all, they performed, they performed good enough as you saw from the results. But also we wanted to keep a very low overhead. That's why we uh, decided that, uh, you know, neural networks running at runtime might have been, uh, might have given a greater impact on the overhead. Uh, for the other question, I guess it was for a timing, so maybe for Miguel. Uh, well, the second question is, and same question about WCTs. Yeah, it's about time. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not about power. So uh, I, I think that there's a, an, easy, uh, an easy answer to that. No, we did not retro-engineered uh, NVIDIA's GPUs. I wish we would. I think we'd be very rich if we did that. Um, but in fact, so we are uh, we are using the, the ability to uh, to get uh, measurements uh, to understand uh, how it uh, it uh, executes and how the timings is uh, um, uh, in how the timings of the GPUs impact on the execution in the uh, in the tool application. Okay, so uh, in fact, we we treat it as a black box. Basically, okay. Uh, connecting with the previous question, so we treat the GPU as a black box, but we try to extract information uh, on uh, how it uses to uh, uh, the time it takes to offload the data, to get the data, to uh, execute the data, uh, and so we we measure it from the outside, but also we are trying to use the, the internal counters so that we can understand what's going on, but not retro engineering. The, the GPU. Okay, so uh, uh, Sergio, I think Eric Chan has a continuation on the previous question about uh, DVFS. Okay, uh, but that was also for uh, uh, for timing, right? Uh, so you also mentioned using DVFS. How do you manage to estimate um, worst case execution times when using DVFS? Okay, uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Um, so, but basically, we uh, test the different configurations. So, we test that we do the analysis for the different uh, configurations in terms of frequency, frequency, voltage. So, we uh, uh, we have the different information that we can use for the analysis. Yeah. So, basically, each frequency individually. Yeah. Okay. So I think. It's yeah, thank you for the for the questions. Very, very yeah, nice. Thank you.
Okay, so now I think it's time to Omaso. 